Welcome to Famous People You've Never Heard Of, the podcast brought to you by Blue Fire Theatre Company. Each week, Lottie, Linda or Steve will guide you through the centuries to shine the spotlight once again on entertainers the world has forgotten. Thank you so much for joining us as we chat to our fabulous guests and find out more about these forgotten superstars of history. If you enjoy the podcast, do please rate, review and most importantly, subscribe so that you never miss an episode and more people find out about us. And now, let us delay no longer in introducing you to a famous person you've never heard of. Welcome back to Famous People You've Never Heard Of. And today in our Zoom room, we have the delightful Elena Masson, who, pleasure to meet you. Um, And Elena has been performing a fantastic play about Clara Schumann. And everyone knows Clara Schumann's other half, um, but not so many people know Marvellous Clara. So, Elena, um, lovely to see you. Lovely to see you, Lottie. Thank you. My absolute pleasure. Um, Now, do you want to give us a little bit of background about you um, and then we can go on and and have a chat about how much you have or haven't got in common with the marvellous Clara? (laughs) (laughs) Sure. So um, I'm Eleanor and I'm an Italian and now British um, actress and and general performer because I also play the piano. And um, I grew up in Italy. I moved here 16 years ago and I, um, I've always acted and I studied languages as well, which is another passion of mine, as well as piano, to one extent. Then I stopped, so I'm not as good as Clara. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, So yeah, and then I wrote Clara in 2018, is my first play as a writer um, and producer as well, which I should put in because there's a lot of producing work that you have to to commit to when you when you write your own piece and put it on and uh yeah super i'm feeling your pain on the production front <laughs> <laughs> there and done that um, so why did you choose to to write and perform something about clara um initially it was very you know, I, I say random with inverted commas because it's never casual you know it's, it's, there's always something that leads you to a choice eventually but um Oh, initially as well. So I thought, I want to write something where I can play the piano in. And I was like, oh, I need to find a composer. And I thought, how do I any female composers? And and I started researching. There's so many female composers I've never heard of. And I thought, maybe it's me because I haven't completed my conservatoire. You know, my knowledge is limited. But, may, you know, loads of other women musicians and you know, professional musicians do you know about her. Or knew very little about her. Just oh yeah, she had an affair with like what? <laughs> no, there's so much more about her. And then I, I you know discovered a story, biographies, and she's so interesting. She was so controversial, so fascinating. The music is really profound and and very yeah, not not played so much um, and not considered as well as Robert's music. Or well, do you know? There, there is a whole series of what we do about female composers to be done, um, but we've already done two of them. Um, this is our third. Um, I feel more coming on because they are just really underrepresented. People don't know um, what actually went on, sort of especially before the 20th century, certainly. But what I discovered in my you know, female research is not just for composers. There's so many, whether it's scientists or um, novelists, um, poets, doctors, there's been so many in history, but because it's you know all put under the carpet for some reason, but they exist, they have existed, and it's important that we know they, they actually did exist. Um, <laughs> Absolutely, and they're excellent role models as well. Totally. Uh, yeah, so Clara, I mean, her, her life story is, it's fascinating really, isn't it? So she's, she was a child prodigy, mm-hmm. so uh, yeah. the the female Mozart of her age. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the same kind of father she had. <laughs> the same father of Mozart. Very, got... very strict and, um, but in some ways enlightened as well. It's, as well, it's, 
it's hard to, you know, it's, you can't judge them, you know, it's just, on the one hand, it was horrible and a tyrant, and the other hand, it was an enlightened man, and um, it's, it's, well, to some extent. It's, well, yeah, to some extent. I mean, the, the thing that really freaked me about her father was that he wrote her diary for her, told oh, yes. her what to put yeah. in the diary. <laughs> yeah, the diary is a recurrent yeah, element of it, you know, it was very important and funny to me, but also tragic for Port Clara. Yeah, he was so domineering that he wrote her own diary <laughs> until she was 13. <laughs> so he was so controlling, and I feel like, I don't know. Mm. But he he was typical stage school parent, wasn't he? Put her on the road to success, though. <laughs> yeah, for his own success. Yes. Yeah, he, yeah. <laughs> Yes, and and she met her husband when she was tiny. She was yeah. nine, wasn't That's she? Yeah. There's a creepy element of the show. <laughs> yeah, she was nine, and he was nineteen. So uh, there was some, you know, it's another era. But he was fascinated by her because she was such a good pianist at the age of nine. And the father, of course, was really proud of that, and he became a famous pedagogue because of Clara. So that was the aim. And, and Robert, uh, the future husband, Robert Schumann, um, he he wanted to become a pianist. Um, of course, then he injured his finger and he just dedicated just, just dedicated himself <laughs> to composing brilliantly. <laughs> but um, but he was fascinated by this girl. It's like if she can play that well, I need to learn with this man. So that's why he went to Vick, um, uh, Mr. Vick, and, um, and wanted to to learn with him. So he was actually her father's pupil. Yes. Oh, this is getting we exciting. That, yeah, <laughs> we boarded that for a while in the house, and so they did. You know, they start you know knowing each other from a very young age for her, and so uh, yeah, he was nineteen year old boy, but you know, yeah. she was nine. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when did they actually get married? How old was she then? Uh, twenty one. She just as uh, turned twenty one. Oh, so as soon as she legally could without her father's permission. Yeah, but she, right. she it, 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 you've seen the play, so she, mm-hmm. well, I don't want to spoil it, but it's a story, um, history actually. She uh, she had to apply, uh, to appeal to the court to get permission because dad said, no, you're not going to get married and ruin my career, basically. <laughs> you know, your career, but my career. Um, you're not going to get married to this stupid man and uh, it's ridiculous. And, and she said, okay, I'm going to do it anyway. So... <laughs> And she, she did. did. <laughs> yeah, she did. Yeah. And they had lots of children, didn't they, yeah. humans? <laughs> yeah. I love that the poster of you advertising your show with the baby is very funny. Everyone should look out for that. <laughs> Edinburgh Fringe this year. <laughs> More baby. coming up about that. Baby. <laughs> yes. Indeed. So how many children did she have? Uh, she, she gave birth to eight children, um, one died very little, was sixteen months. Sixteen months, and but yeah, I'm, I've so referred to seven children in the show just to, to make it simpler to the audience. But she had eight children, and a few miscarriages, so she was definitely yeah, constantly pregnant throughout her marriage. Gosh, and was she very maternal? Uh, from what I read, and, and my perspective is no, she wasn't. Um, maybe she would have been. She had stopped to one or two. <laughs> <laughs> it was overwhelming and and I guess also the relationship with with children was very different at the time as well as then we also need to put it into context um even for women with, that were not working um the majority of them uh, so Clara was an exception because she was working she she was the breadwinner of the family in many ways although Robert was you know making money with his music but she she was actually being paid so much more than he was and she had so many mouths to feed um and the husband it was quite demanding in terms of you know emotional support and physical support so she didn't seem to be very maternal especially reading what the mill uh, the later eugene sorry um uh, the the youngest of the daughters wrote about her um so yeah it, it's interesting because, you know, she, from the, the little that I've read and from what you've just said, she, she does sound like she was very much a career woman and she was very, you know, she was so responsible for, for feeding the entire family. There's no time for all the niceties. But there was the episode when she came back through the 
the firing guns and Lord knows what else to actually save her children when her house was under siege. Yeah. So you know, through dead of night on her own, walking yeah. through the fields. In the barricades. Yeah, that was she was pregnant and she had other five kids to rescue. Not rescue, but she left them uh, at a relative's house, a friend's house, while there were the turmoils in, in I think it was Dresden and in East Germany. And uh and Robert was too, you know, not in the in the right state of mind and so she did, just she went out, you know, with people shooting or whatever they were doing in a fighting, and just pregnant, six months pregnant, went to pick up the kids. Um, I think she was, and but also she, you know, she was and wasn't. Again, I'm not trying to judge her, but I think she also grew up in a very strange env- family, family environment with a mother that divorced her husband in an age where women, you know, yes, you could divorce your husband under the Prussian law, but uh, you not have the, the luxury, let's say, to raise your children. So she had to leave the children to Mr. Beek. Um, so I guess it was so horrible that she decided to even leave the kids for, you know, <laughs> the poor Marianne. So she didn't have a mother. She had a very strict father. And I think the way to please him was to play well. So it was very connected to the way she was getting love and affection, the way she played. And the same with her husband, really. Because um, he fell in love with her when he saw her playing those music, years before. Yes, it's all musically connected. All this love mm. and affection comes from, it's like a retribution for your music, you know, genius somehow. So it's really hard to to separate it from the music. And um, so, yeah, I don't know. Again, I never tried to judge her, but I thought it was, I, I tried to, to imagine how would you feel as a woman that has this, maybe a thing of myself, you know, how much you loved your art and what you want to do, but also having a family and relationships, how do they affect, you know, despite the fact that you really love that person, you really love your kids, but at the same time you really want to play because that's your source of joy and, and you know, the blood through, that, that runs through your veins. How do you find that balance? So maybe she had, um, she found it difficult, but also she came from a difficult family where, you know, as her, her points of reference were not whatever normal is, that wasn't it, was yeah. it? Yeah. And she had a very practical education. Like her dad took to everything that she needed to know for touring. So she knew the languages she needed to tour. She knew how to do accountancy. She was very practical. So I guess, you know, for her going to rescue the kids or feeding the children was something, yeah, it's practical and how to do that. I think in, in that sense, Robert was more, you know, the maybe i don't like to label things but maybe he had more of the feminine side and she was more the practical you know? yeah. that kind of yeah. inverted if it could be inver- if there's any inversion there but um he was more that kind of figure very empathic very emotional and she was more the practical yeah. breadwinner he's definitely the artist in inversion yeah. covers, isn't he yeah yeah, yeah. and and suffered ill health too so he, he died very young he died very young. Yes, he was 47, if I remember correctly. And he, um, apparently, when he was younger, he, he contracted syphilis, and that's why he got a little bit crazy. <laughs> um, but, no, you know, we don't know because she never got that. Um, she had an amazing health, clearly. Um, but he he was always very weak and suffered from depression, and, you know, he wanted to end a retired life from society, he wanted to compose and live in, you know, this kind of... Um, romantic, idyllic place, um, and Clara was very much a woman of the world and of stage. She she performed since a young age. She liked to be under the spotlight, so it was very very different there. Yes, so to be a fly on the wall at their dinner parties. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> and what what was his reaction to to her success, or, or was she forced to sort of just you know try and be a bit less successful, shall we say? That's another aspect that you know I interpret it in a certain way, but in by reading the letters, the biography, I I don't think it was directly what he said I think he always supported her um I, I never forgot how much they loved each other there was a lot of passion and love and really and respect between them but also I think 
maybe there was a lack of wisdom in the choices that these people made because you know if you're so young and raptured by your passion and you you know you're blinded by love but you don't consider all the things that you really want to do and maybe she has considered it for a short while but then she went the other way and and then at some point things clash um which is normal you know it's just things that happen happen in relationships and couples and I think he was very supportive of her but from it was also a man of his time and I think when you read the diaries the letters and the things that he would say to her it was like oh <laughs> you know maybe he was suppressing her a little bit and um and she was suffering from it because he was the reference for her she really adored him and loved him the way he adored and loved her but then any criticism coming from him was you know a narrow in a chest um so it's again it's something very controversial that I, I don't have a full answer but I got some interpretations in you know in, in the show and um and, and I think it's just a normal relationship balance and something happens these days too and I don't think people necessarily do it because they want to repress you or or feel insecure and they want you to feel bad about your success but it's mainly just their own insecurity their own desire to have you by their side I don't know well it's more about their their views of of what they want for themselves isn't it I don't think yeah yeah, and you know, so it just comes out, but it might not be necessarily malicious. But you know, it's, it's a normal, uh, what normal? Um, it's a common, let's say, common relation relationship problem, I suppose, yeah. that needs to be dealt with. Um, so, w- when Clara and Robert were, were both working, um, because they both were working at the same time, weren't they? It's I, I don't. My history is not that good. But I'm getting the feeling that there were quite a few power couples within the music world as well. It wasn't just them, was it? <laughs> no, 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 not just them. No. So uh, it was quite an accepted thing for husband and wife to to be successful in, yeah. in the headlines. And, yeah, and all yeah. That. And, and their careers obviously took quite different um, routes because he ended up being a composer and he conducted a bit as well, um, apparently not terribly successfully. Um, but was she mainly known for her compositions or as a concert pianist? Yeah, mainly as a concert pianist. She was, um, she, she, for what I understood, she was the woman who, rev, you know, revolutionised the ways of, of concept, the, the concept of, con, of uh, concept of concert pianists, mm-hmm. how a concert pianist should be and the repertoire. She started learning to play from memory and people were not playing from memory at that time. So it's, it's a new way of uh, of of um, of playing the piano. Um, mm. Yeah, that's amazing. That, that's a really in, innovation, isn't it? You know, just you know, the first person to be playing from memory. That's... And um, yeah, she started this kind of new school of of, of uh, concert pianists, and um, and she but she she wasn't so known for at that time she wasn't known at all for compositions she didn't publish the compositions she was very insecure she always in the letters you can see how in the diaries how much she doubted herself and, and actually robert encouraged her so much and you know of course it was his area of expertise and he was encouraging her a lot to to compose more but also you know she didn't have the time she had kids and you know <laughs> She was probably tired. She had baby brains, and then she was still practicing every day and going and concert and, and concertize around touring uh, when she could, because she didn't tour a lot um, in the central years of the marriage because of his health. The children it was really hard to look after them, so she was just doing local concerts, and for her, it was not enough. Um, no, she did some big international tours, didn't she? Oh God, she did. Yeah, yeah. before marriage, and um, the first few years of marriage. Um, and then after he died, yeah, she toured a lot and she came to England many times. She went to Scotland. She regretted not having been to America. She was offered a, a massive tour to America. She's like, let's go, let's go, come on, we're going to make so much money for like five years. And she was like, no, no, we can't go. <laughs> so he, you know, because of him, she didn't go. You know, at that time, imagine going to America meant like six months, you know, at least, because you had to travel by boat for two months or whatever it took. And 
and then touring all the states wherever she was going and she was really up for it he wouldn't have coached would he bless him no he didn't cope with when they went to Russia, I found that really hilarious. That's why I put it in the show. Um. <laughs> that's, that's actually, I, I've just been reading about that. And, and the thing that I've taken away from that was, you know, she was a real tough cookie because it was a cold Russian winter, wasn't it? And Clara just gets on with it. Just, yeah. you know. She gets on with it. She left the two kids with relatives and she just goes through, you know, the high snow of St. Petersburg and is there moaning that it's cold. <laughs> it's too hot. Um, and the funny story about that is, I will never forget when I was reading the, the story. So, of course, it's funny because they refer to the husband of Mrs. Schumann when they talk about the night. And that's hilarious because she's Mrs. Schumann and he's the husband of. And then the pensive expression that he has on the piano is the one they took for his bust they created in, on his tomb. So the one, you know, very pensive and sad expression is from that night. So every every time you remember his picture, you know, when they, they portray Schumann and it's actually the sculpture that is on, on his tomb, on his grave, it's that one from that night. Oh, <laughs> poor Robert. Very sad, <laughs> pensive loner. <laughs> but Clara loved him. Oh, yes. Yes, she did. So what, what happened after he died? She certainly didn't stop, did she? She'd been sort of at his powerhouse all the way through. Um, yeah, I think for her it was a revival for her career to really make use of the last last 40 years of her life that she had after 30 to to play, to play, to play, to play. And and she did. She toured a lot. She was not stopping. But she had, again, she had seven children to support. And she, he was, well, for two years, it's been two and a half years, he was in a hospital, in a private hospital that she paid for. Uh, she had a massive house, seven children, boarding schools, and you know, she had to provide for them. I mean, a new ba- newborn baby, and um, just she had a lot to do. But so, did she sort of take that opportunity to do more touring? I mean, she obviously didn't just hide into herself, did she? And think, oh, I've just got to got to do the bare minimum to keep everything going. No, she definitely toured a lot, and. So in the, in the two years it's been in the hospital and after she taught, every, you know, she was mainly on tour. Mm-hmm. There was um, one of her children was in, the, in self in a mental hospital. And, and one of, you know, it's, it's quite sad when they mention that she actually barely visited him. So, <laughs> but she was, you know, I don't know, it's really hard to, you know, some people, I read some articles when they're really criticising her, but they will not criticise a man in the same way that she, they criticised her. But, you know, if you think about, as you said, she had to to be the breadwinner for them. They were underage, they were little kids, and she had to pay for them to support them. What would she do if she had just stopped? Um, and maybe she was. it was also a way to, to stay connected to what she had because playing was all, music was always the way to feel the emotions to be close to Robert and I wonder whether you know it was also continuing his legacy and promoting his music even after his death. Mm. Um, she, she moved in some very interesting circles didn't she I think wasn't Brahms a lodger in the house at one point? <laughs> yeah <laughs> thank you well that was that was when when Robert well, both Robert and Clara were really really fascinated to say the least by Brahms um musically and we don't know what else <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, we can surmise. <laughs> but um but there's been also a lot of talks about that so i remember when i discovered clara's music and and clara itself everyone was like oh yeah well, didn't she have an affair with with brahms like oh, i don't know about that but we don't know the thing is we don't know and i wanted to keep that open in the show as well to respect uh, the fact that they also didn't want people to know so we don't know um, and maybe it was just a platonic relationship. It was definitely a very passionate platonic relationship. Um, but it was a different era and people talk in a different way. And, and it was also the romantic era. So it was very, you know, <laughs> romantic. Very, very romantic by definition. Um, but yeah, she, she had uh, Brahms stayed in a house for a few years. So when Robert was still alive and then while he was in the hospital 
and uh, and he raised the children for a few years. He was making use of the library that they had at home. So it was very important for him to be with the Schumanns. The Schumanns were, you know, institutions at that time for music. Whatever they said, it was, you know, whatever Robert would say about his music was like making his future 40 years of career. And so it was really lucky for Brahms. It was also very talented, but it was absolutely lucky to meet these two people that, you know, definitely marked his career. And Clara promoted his music as much as Robert's in, his, in her concerts. So, you know, it meant a lot because Mrs. Schumann had, a, you know, a voice in the circle. In fact, she was the only woman that was allowed to teach in Frankfurt, uh, the conservatoire. And the director said, we will make this exception only for Mrs. Schumann and no other woman. And <laughs> so she was the only woman teaching there. Um, so she was regarded with much respect. That's amazing. Because yeah. if you look on her Wikipedia page, it says her occupation in this order, pianist, composer and piano teacher. And I wouldn't have thought that piano teacher was actually worthy of putting on. But obviously it was because it was a huge deal. Yes. Yeah. She's not taking private pupils in. And yes. Amazing. No. And she was she would choose them. She would just decide who was coming home, etc. She would not have everyone. She was really, you know, the queen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why she was like, you know, a very big name. So it was I didn't we don't have that I mean now is you can imagine it, but at that time seeing a woman doing what she did and gathering all that respect from, you know, men. <laughs> is she was actually actually I think if I recall well in the director of, of of the the principal of the conservator said she would be treated as a man but it's only, yeah so it's like wow she was elevated to a man rank but she was and only for her you know so just forget about it you women it's just for Mrs Schumann you know she's just exceptional which is horrible if you think about it but also she's the only one who made it so this is how much they thought of her. Um, and in Germany, she's still a very much well-known figure. People know her, you know, still now. Um, so it's, she was very important. And did she stay in Germany? And that was sort of home base forever? Yes, she died in Frankfurt. She she grew up in Leipzig, then she moved to Dresden and um Dusseldorf, where the last house that she had with, home she had with Robert, and he died near Bonn, and then she moved to Frankfurt in um, her older years when she was teaching as well. And did, did any of the, the children go on to do something musical, or were they scared off? Well, well, I guess you know we're two parents like that. Um, but she, I remember she taught all of them to play. So she said, "You can make a living out of teaching." Very practical mm-hmm. again. Very practical. She actually didn't want them to, to pursue their career. I want, you know, maybe she didn't have such a joyful life after all, you know, being a prodigy child and being able to go to school and all those things. But I remember the Felix was the only one with a you know special talent and and the thing was studying violin and composition and it was also good at writing poetry. So he inherited that from Robert as well, was a very literate man. And, but she was very discouraging though. She said, you should, you know, you should just study law. <laughs> but, you know, and Brahms, Brahms listened to him. So I think he's got talent. You should let him, you know, continue. But then he died of TB or something. <laughs> very oh. young. Yeah. She, she outlived most of her kids, which is quite sad. That's really sad. Um, but he was the only one with a special, you know, je ne sais quoi mm-hmm. talent. Um, and the late of uh, a couple of girls as well. The second daughter, Elise, she had um, a very difficult relationship with Clara, love and hatred. And she moved to America and she was a piano teacher, a professional piano teacher. And Eugene, the latest girl, she studied in Berlin. Um, and yeah, we, Joachim was the violin player. I think he was one of her teachers for composition or what. And but she studied in. Piano, piano in Berlin and she became a teacher but not concert pianist and and what did Clara do in her, her twilight years 
as she surely couldn't have carried on working until she was 76. No, she was. She was, of course she was. She was yes. almost blind, almost deaf by then, but she was still, I think maybe the last year she didn't perform so much, but she was, and she was complaining that she was really losing sight so she couldn't, you know, and the memory wasn't so strong anymore. But at that time, living up to 76 with the life she had, you know, all the ch- children she had and, you know, the stress and the emotional distress and the work that she had on the show, the story was not, you know, it's tough now, imagine at that time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, but yeah, no, she, she died and it was really sweet to see, you know, the, reading the page, she died at home with a grandchild, Ferdinand's son, uh, playing music for her on the piano. She played oh, until the very last days, yeah. Do you have any favourite pieces of hers that you recommend people listen to? I love her romances. So I love um, the group of romances that she wrote for um, Robert, Opus 11. All three of them, particularly one I play, do I play two, one, um, two of them in the show, but they're all scattered and not full lengths. Um, but yeah, they're beautiful. And also she wrote three romances for, <laughs> for Brahms. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there's the Opus 21, uh, number one, two, and three. And they're also very beautiful. But I really love the, you know, the, the one she wrote for, for Schumann, for Robert. Uh, the very romantic, like full on romantic era. And, um, yeah. Yes. That's lovely because I think what comes through the, the story with the two of them is that they they were desperately in love and I don't think that ever changed, did it? No, I, I mean, so. circumstances did. Um, but they and, and just reading a little bit about them, they they did seem to be slightly other from they, they didn't do communication with other people terribly well, but they found something in each other, which is really nice. Yeah. Yeah, two yeah. weirdos. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like she, you know, in a way, she was very, you know, not so. She was social and not social at the same time because I don't think she was so good at, you know, being out outward and and communicating with people. She had that circle, and she respected certain people like Joachim and Brahms were friends all along, and a few uh, singers that she really really liked. Um, but yeah, she she was very selective, and I don't think she was so you know you know a sparkle of the party either. But he was particularly a loner and very much of a intimate you know uh, inward person. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the show without giving anything away, and um, because we're going to come and see it, obviously at the Edinburgh Fringe and. I've already seen it, but I'm going to go again. Thank um, you. There we are. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so tell us a little bit about it. Uh, what would you like to know about the show? Sorry. What would you like to know about the show? So what what is the format? Is it just you? Do you have a cast of thousands playing all sorts oh, no. of different types of pianos? <laughs> is there Robert <laughs> and seven well, children? I... No bomb traps? <laughs> Very expensive show. No, yes. I... <laughs> Um, no, it's, it's a solo show. So it's me and the piano, which is an important presence in the show, because I believe that the show could not exist. Clara could not exist without piano, without music. And they had to be me play, not because I'm particularly good, but because, um, because it's, it doesn't matter. It's the, it's the connection that she has with the piano and how I imagine the words to be um woven with the music um so it's all together i imagine certain scenes connected to the pieces of music that's why they're there in a certain moment um and i very much wrote based on the music um so it's a solo show there are a few other characters that come in through me um and so the interpretation of clara of those characters uh, characters have been particularly important to her or episodes have been particularly important to her some of them are fictional uh, most of them are biographical uh, I think I like to define this show as a dark comedy show because there's quite a lot of comedy but in a dark way and it's also quite profound and I like um, you know my interpretation of Clara is yeah that of um, how to put it I like people to 
go away with a feeling of um, joy, but also sadness, and also reflect upon what relationships are like. It's not a, so much about feminism, but it's more about how we we deal with relationships and how we all have you know have these kind of problems and how can we solve them and how love and wisdom should be balanced. Um, <laughs> it's just a a human portrait, you know, I didn't think of it as a massive feminist show that some people might think of it because of the criticism to the husband, but I mainly thought about a human being that's going through struggles that we still have because it's the human nature. <laughs> but so I just thought she was just a beautiful soul to portray. A beautiful story. And it's beautiful music. And it's yeah. And it's a lovely show. So tell us, when's it on? Edinburgh Fringe 2022. Yes, very excited to be back on stage from the 8th to the 14th of August at Piano Drum um, in Old Royal High in Calton Hill. Piano Drum sounds like it's the perfect venue. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's stunning. It's just, I wouldn't have done it if I hadn't found that venue. It's just the perfect place. Piano Drum is in Calton Hill at 5 o'clock. You heard it here first. Oh, we'll put all the, the details on the show notes as to where and uh, when you can see the show and uh, all the other information about Clara and Eleanor that everybody needs. So um, thank, you. thank you ever so much for joining us. You, you're a star and it's such an interesting subject. I really hope that uh, everyone takes it on board and goes away and listens to Clara's music. Yes, and me too. She's yeah, brilliant. She's wonderful. And uh, as ever, she, she is a star, but you've been an excellent support act. And, <laughs> um, and everyone who's going up to the Edinburgh Fringe, go and see Eleanor's show. Thank you Thank very you. much. Lovely to speak to you. Take care. for listening to famous people you've never heard of. If you've enjoyed this week's podcast and would like to find out more, do take a look at the show notes where you'll find further information and reading material, as well as a transcription of today's episode. If you like what we do and would like to support our work, please check out our Patreon page, which can be found at patreon.com slash theatre. Or, if you prefer to keep us going with a caffeine fix, you can do so at coffee.com. That's ko-fi.com slash theatre. We really appreciate any support you can give to help keep the show on the road. And we'd also love it if you give the show a rate and a review. It really helps us to remain visible out there. And don't forget, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter, where we'd love to see you.